Um, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our favorite seminar. Um, today we have a double act, uh, two speakers, Romain and Hakim, who are um, both from France, different parts of France, as we just established, Paris and um, Poitiers. Um, and they are going to present to us an application of graph transformation in uh, to, to geometry, to geometric modeling. And, and if you think that is obvious, you're probably correct in the sense that it's a very natural thing to do, but um, you'll, you'll, you'll see, I think, that this is not, 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 not easy. So it uh, has its subtleties and its complexities as well. Um, so Romain will start, um, and I understand that he's um, sort of the mathematical brains behind the outfit and, and um, sort of takes care of the foundations, and Hakim is then going to um, explain to us about the applications of that in, well, video games probably. So, so let's, let's see and find out. So, so welcome and, and, and please go ahead, the stage is yours, Romain. All right, thank you very much for the possibility to talk at the Greta seminar. So today I'm gonna to be speaking about application of gra graph transformation in the fields of computer graphics, and more precisely in the field of geometric modeling. Geometric modeling, it's basically a subfield of computer science that deals with the manipulation of virtual objects in any dimension. It has many applications across several domains, such as architecture, computer-aided computer design, of video games and movies. And more precisely, we are working in a subfield that is called topology-based geometric modeling. The idea is that objects in computer graphics are usually handled through some kind of subdivision into smaller objects. And in our case, we will be splitting the object into topological cells. These are volume, faces, edges, or vertices of the object. And we will build the corresponding data structure that will be a graph using some kind of subdivision by recursively decreasing the dimension. So in the end, what you obtain is a graph. And this graph is labeled on the arcs by integers that represent the dimension and how the subparts of the object are interconnected. And because you want the object to be represented table within the computer, and you may want to do some computation on the object, you have to add some values that we call embedding or geometry. And they will describe, for instance, that the object is blue or it's green or where it is in a space. And so since you have some graph that represent the object, you can modify the object using graph transformations. This means that the operation that we'll be using are modeled through some kind of DPO graph transformations. So if we want to use DPO transformation in the fields of geometry, geometric modeling, we have to fulfill some requirements. So first is the idea that all the standards operation needs to be somewhat expressible. And then there is something that mainly comes from how people use um, modeling operation in the geometric modeling community. There is the fact that whenever you, def you define an operation, it's parameterized by the cell. So for instance, a face, and you will define an operation that modify uh, like a face. So you can think of tri triangulating a face and you want to be able to triangulate a square, a rectangle, a triangle, a pentagon, anything, and you want this operation to be just a single operation, and you don't want to be you don't want to specify it depending on the size of the cell. And then, the actual reason to use graph transformation is that it's it's you, it's easy to to study the preservation of the consistency, but even though it's easy, you still have to do it. So we'll have to study some kind of preservation conditions. And the last part is performance efficiency. It, it would be nice to have a tool that works great in theory, 
but if in practice it's not usable and if it's like really slow compared to other uh, software in the geometric modeling community, then you have a tool that is some kind of worthless. So in the, ca in the case of the Jerboa platform, which has been developed for about 15 years, we've kind of solved most of these um, requirements. For the case of the standard operation, we just benchmarked and provide them, all of them within Jaboa. And we, we extended the standard GPO transformation using a scheme that this is the main topic of the talk. And then we extended these um, schemes, these rule schemes with constraint that set, that um, guarantees that the consistency of the model is preserved. And we actually have a syntax checker that takes the rule and says, yes, the rule is correct, or no, the rule is not correct. And these are the issues with the rule. And as far as the performance are concerned, this, this is something that Akim will talk a bit about, but this is, the idea is that the, the rules are compiled, so in the end you get code, and this code is somewhat optimized to be efficient. So as I said, this has already been done, so what am I going, what am I going to talk about? Well, basically, this has been done in the case of the model that is called generalized maps, which is somewhat really regular. It's homogeneously defined in any dimension, but it is not the most popular model. Actually, the most popular one is called oriented maps because it has uh, the main advantage of being uh, lighter in memory. So what I want to talk about today is how we can extend the work that has been done on generalized map uh, and to the model of oriented maps. And I will briefly present the two models and explain what are the limitations that we had to um, bypass in the case of the model of oriented maps. So first I'm gonna be talking about the data structure so oriented and, and generalized maps. And then I will explain how we can generalize the operations and how we can make sure that they are uh, consistency preserving. So about the model, as I said, we represent the objects through its subdivision into topological cells. So I'm gonna take the example of this object on the left, which is an orange triangle and a green rectangle. Everything is embedded in a space, so you actually have to consider the outer face H. And then you're gonna split the object recursively by decreasing dimension. So because it's an object in 2D, you first split the faces. So you get these blue dots, uh, blue arcs, sorry, that, that means that the, for instance, if you consider the W uh, edge here, it, it belongs to the, to the orange face at the top, and it also belongs to the green face at the bottom. So we had an, a blue arc here. That means that there is some kind of dependence between the two faces. And then we recursively subdivide the object. So now that we've subdivided along the second dimension, we subdivide along the first dimension. So we're splitting edges. In this case, we had these red arcs that splits the edges. And when, when you're at this stage, there are two possibilities. The first possibility is that you stop here and you consider that this is your graph. And in this case, you actually have to orient the object which makes some kind of assumption on, on the object. It has to be orientable. And then you just turn the red arcs according to, to the orientation in order to obtain the graph that is on the right. And you can see that we've, so the arcs are, are colored in order to denote the dimensions. So black is for the dimension one and blue for the dimension two and the first dimension is oriented, whereas the second is not. And we have value on the nodes. In this case, these are colors that denote what the color was of the original faces. So as I said, there is two possibility. 
The, the second one is actually to subdivide along one more dimension. So the zero dimension, which means you're splitting vertices. And in this case, you obtain an, a generalized map. And this is pretty obvious that since you split it once more, you obtain twice the number of nodes. So the object is somewhat twice memory-wise. And in the case of the generalized map, there's also another way to consider the object that is to consider it closed. This means that you remove the outer face H. So you remove all the nodes that were belonging to this face and you replace the dangling arcs by loops, which is the graph that is here in the middle. So you have two models that are really close to one another, but yet they are pretty different because of this orientation on the first dimension. So if we want to provide some formal definitions, we can think of them as labeled graphs, labeled on the arcs. For the case of the generalized map, it's oriented, it's labeled by dimensions from zero to n. So in this case, uh, zero, one, and two. And it has uh, some kind of constraint that comes from the um, algebraic definition, which has some which, which uses some properties on permutation, and we will directly translate them into constraint on the graph. So the first one is called the incident arcs constraint, which means that whenever there is a node, there should be one arc incoming and outgoing for each dimension. So in this case, there is you can see that each node has a blue, dark and red arc, so dimension two, zero, and one. And this is true everywhere. You also have some kind of non-orientation. The easiest way to put it would be to say that the graph is undirected, but for comparison with the oriented maps model, I will say that whenever there is an arc, there should be an, a reverse arc with the same label. And if you take this condition and you factor the fact that there could only be one arc per dimension, you get that the graph is undirected. And the last conditions that translate some involution property on the permutation is that whenever there is an ij, ij pass, this pass should be a cycle if i plus two is smaller than j. So, and then we can compare compare this definition with the definition of oriented maps. So it's slightly different, but not too much. So first, because we didn't split the zero dimension, it's labeled with arcs from one to n. So naturally the incident arcs and cycle constraint only starts with i equal to one, but then the non-orientation constraints uh, only start with the second dim dimension so you, you actually need to consider a directed graph and then impose constraint on the dimensions that are bigger than two. And just for not notation purpose, I will denote capital D, the set of dimensions. So I can talk the same way about uh, oriented maps and generalized maps. So now that we have the definition of the object, as I said, we were kind of splitting the object into cells, so faces, edges, and vertices, but how do we actually get them in the graph? The, the answer is that there are some kind of a subgraph, but when you, it, this would be completely true for the model of generalized map, but will not be in the case of oriented map. So the easiest way to, to consider the two model at once is to use words of dimension. So in the case of oriented map, for the face, you have to consider all arcs that are reachable by a zero arc or a one arc. So you can consider the words that are built on the, using this expression, so zero or one, and you can iterate them. And in the case of oriented map, you, you get the phase by simply cycling through the one dimension. So it's pretty similar with the case of the edge. It's the dimension zero and two that are concerned for the generalized map 
and only the dimension two in the case of the oriented map. But when you come to the to the ver vertices, this is like the huge difficulty that we will we'll be facing when talking about uh, modeling operations, because in the case of the generalized map, the definition is somewhat the same. It's just two possibilities, either one or two. But in the case of the oriented map, you actually need to consider passes of lens two. So if you start with the green node here, you have con to consider a pass that is first a two arc and then a one arc. But you discard this, the vertex, the node here that is in the middle. So the vertex is actually, actually consists of these three nodes here. And we have to consider some kind of pass labels in order to get them. And similarly, I will use the, the notation capital W to denote uh, some kind of language on the alphabet D. Uh, such that I can talk somewhat freely about orbits because we will use these orbits to generalize the, the modeling operations. So modeling our operations, as I said, we want to modify the object. And since the object are graphs, it's pretty easy to define the modification using graph transformation. So if you consider standard DPO rewriting, uh, you have the rule at the top uh, which is uh, two nodes A and B linked with a, a one arc that are replaced by, we add two new nodes and we complete the graph. And if, if you apply this rule somewhere on the graph, in this case, we use the morphisms that send A onto A and B onto B, you will modify the graph. And this modification actually represents um, the insertion of an edge. So if you were to represent the object underneath, you would obtain this transformation. But this transformation only modifies locally the, the graph and would not be applicable if the, this, the vertex here was to belong to several faces. So we will need some kind of uh, generalization of this operation. So I'm going to try to explain what the difficulties are. So take this surface and assume that we will want to subdivide each face. Uh, so we will want to add some kind of a vertex in the middle of the face, a vertex in the middle of each edge. And then we will uh, link the middle, the middle vertex with the midpoint vertices. And if you only modify the pink face in the middle, you will obtain this modification. But as you can see, modifying the pink face actually modified the adja adjacent faces uh, at the top, right, bottom, and left, because we added a new vertex. So if you were to think about this kind of modification as a DPO rule, you, you will see that the rule is, uh, is not sequ sequentially independent, nor parallel independent. And the standard solution in this case is to use some amalgamation techniques to kind of be able to modify the old surface at once. But if you do this, what you actually obtain is a rule that has the complete object on as left hand side and the complete subdivided object as the right hand side. So in the end, you would obtain this object, but this would be tailored to this specific surface and the rule will not be applicable to any other surface. So we, what I want to talk about is how we can get this kind of generalization uh, by without having uh, two uh, rules that are too huge. So it was, how was it done on generalized map? The, old, the idea was to use some kind of orbit rewriting through variables uh, that were some kind of extension of Hoffman variables. Um, the idea is that if you consider, in this case, it's the triangulation of a face and you can, 
you can we've colored we've somewhat colored the the orbits using uh, so the node of the same orbits so at the at at the beginning you have a face so it's orbit with zero and one in the case of generalized maps and you re, you rewrite these orbits by adding two new orbits, the green and the blue one and by relabeling the various arcs so you copy all the orbits and then you relabel the arcs and if you try to understand the modification at the scale of a single node you will see that the node has a node going one one and zero arcs so the red and the black and if you take this red this dark arc here it's it's kept by the transformation so we can say that the relabeling of this arc uh, sends zero onto zero and the red arc here is deleted so you remove the one arc and then you can copy you can copy all the the red uh, the red nodes into two copies the green and the blue one the green has a blue arc wherever there was a red arc at the beginning so you can see that we've in this case we've relabeled the red arc into a blue arc this works the same for the blue node and in the case of the blue node we also have a red arc here that replace the black initial arc and then you can see that whenever there is a node there is a, a link between the node and its copy from the red to the green and from the green to the blue from the green to the blue we have an arc of dimension one and from the uh, sorry from the green to the blue we have an arc of dimension zero and from the green to the red an arc of dimension one so in the end you can write this kind of transformation uh, using a graph transformation that is uh, that uses variables on the node that um, denote the orbit rewriting but the issue is that it will not work in the case of oriented maps because we have uh, orbits that will have actually that will actually have words so this does not directly work and we need to extend this kind of orbit rewriting and the idea is that uh, basically orbit rewriting in this case it can be seen as a, a product between this node and the initial orbits in order to get the resulting graph and what we what i want to show is that if we actually explicitly uh, constru construct the product using a pullback we can we can embed this rewriting into a, a, a graph transformation so first i want to give some context about how you can use product uh, so pull back on the terminal element to kind of model uh, some global rewriting on the graph so the first example is how can you delete all arcs that share the same label then it's just that you do the product with the graph that has one node and one loop per dimension minus the dimension that you want to delete so in this case we have a label one two and three and we remove the two and if you do the product with the initial graph then you will just delete the two arcs and if if you generalize this you can somewhat try to relabel uh, a graph so if you consider a relabeling function that sends two onto three uh, it can be described using a relation because so the relation set is one sent onto one two sent onto three and three sent onto three so you have three couples and we can some the idea is to simulate this um this function in the appropriate category so what we will do is we will embed the the initial graph in the category that has two labels uh, that are where the arcs are labeled by a couple so two labels so we do this using a functor that we call the embedding functor and it transform a an i arc into ij arcs with each possible j 
the idea is that if you add each possible J, then you have each possible relabeling. And I just highlighted uh, the blue arcs that are the arcs that we will actually matter in the end. So now that we're in the proper category, we can somewhat simulate the, the relabeling, so simulate the function using a product. So the product actually applies the relabeling by deleting all the arcs that we don't care about. And the last, the last step is to get only the, re the relabeled parts of, the, of each coupled. So we apply again a functor that will erase the first part of the label. So as a summary, the construction to modify somewhat globally a graph is depicted by a diagram where we start with a functor, then we apply a pullback, which is product on the terminal element. And then we apply a functor again in order to go back into the initial category. But uh, if we do this, we can only modify a single graph. And the idea is that uh, if you replace uh, the graph pi with any graph that is labeled with a pass in a dimension, you can simulate the relabeling of a pass into a dimension and you will be able to modify a graph. And that's what we do. But first we need to specify uh, what are the paths that we will consider in the initial graph. So on the left, you have a, a graph that is labeled by one, two and threes. And we apply a functor that uh, transform um, any W pass. So where W is inside the labeling set that we use for pass. And whenever there was a W pass, we add an arc. So for instance, if we start on one and we follow the one arc and then the two arc, we end up on D. So after the functor, there is a single arc that is labeled two, one from A to D. And for technical purpose, uh, in order to be able to properly uh, take care of the orientation of the object in the case of the oriented map, because we want the object to be properly oriented, we actually add some kind of bar over the letters to represent the fact that we might want to traverse some arcs backwards. And in the end, this is how we obtain the application of a rule scheme. The idea is that you will apply this kind of product transformation onto each part of the rule in order to be to obtain a rule in the category of the graph that you will want to modify. So this G will be a generalized map or an oriented map. And here are three graphs that are labeled by a word uh, on arcs by a word on W and a letter on G. And the complete process is first from G, you apply this pattern functor in order to get the pass. Then because you will not want to modify the whole graph, you use a monomorphism to only select some part of the graph to modify. Then you embed this, this part into the proper category. Then you apply products on each graph of the scheme to obtain a new, uh, a new span here that you will project back into the proper category. And then you obtain a rule that is applicable using standard GPO rewriting. And you will obtain some kind of modification that are global up to uh, this graph PV that has been uh, taken, extracted from the graph embedded using the pattern functor. So if we want to give an example, we actually have to add, because, because we, if we want to apply the rule, uh, like uh, on, on the tool, we need a way to be able to construct the monomorphism. So we, we, we use a way to specify a node on the left hand side of the scheme rule and a node on the graph. So on the graph, it means that we will be applying the modification here and that the graph uh, 
uh, the maximal subgraph that contains this node is the one that we will take after applying the pattern functor. So starting on this graph, we, we build the path, we obtain, we select a maximal subgraph, and then we build product using the scheme that is on the top right to obtain a rule that we can actually apply on the object. And it will only modify the red elements, but it will modify them somewhat globally in the sense that they will all be modified similarly. So we can use this to provide some uh, application in the fields of geometric modeling. So we can define operations. Um, I, will, I will not develop them, all of them, but here is the case of the cone operation. So we start with a, with a face that is isolated. So it's actually a surface. We can represent it with a single nodes and three uh, loops for each dimension. And then we will modify it in order to obtain a cone. So a cone is the initial face, then the uh, vertical triangles, and then the, uh, the vertex at the top. So the vertex at the top is denoted here by the opposite node. In, in this initial node, we remove the, the two arcs in order to be able to properly add a new face and nodes B and C here uh, denote the new face that we've added. And we can, now that we've uh, somewhat generalized the rule, the rule schemes in the case of generalized map to oriented map, we can do the same for uh, oriented maps and we get a, a scheme that is somewhat similar in the sense that it has somewhat the same size. But as you can see, we have some uh, some bar of uh, uh, dimensions. That means that some dimension have, be, have to be traversed reversely in order to, uh, set, to preserve the orientation of the object. And now that we have a cone, we can round it. So we transform each edge into a face. Here is the scheme for GMAP. Here is the scheme for OMAP. Again, the size are quite similar. But so for some operations, in this case, this is the face extrusion that takes the face and build a volume out of it uh, to finally build uh, the little house in 3D. We have a rather linear uh, scheme rule in the case of GMAP. And in the case of oriented maps, we get a more, much more complicated operation. But yet, because we uh, we have some uh, conditions on the graph, on the rules that help us uh, somewhat write the rules. We we can we we it's easier to write them, and that's more or less what I want to talk about now. It's the consistency preservation. So uh, the idea is that the model have to somewhat be properly defined such that uh, the object is representable. And we have some constraint on both the topology and the geometry. And the idea is that whenever you modify an object, you should obtain an object that is well-formed. And uh, so we enrich the transformation with conditions. And the idea is that uh, these conditions provide feedback to the user in order to help uh, the rule design. So I will first talk about topological consistency. Uh, the idea is to preserve the three constraints that I, I gave at the beginning. So the incident arcs constraint, the non-orientation and the cycles. Uh, those three conditions are first order logic, uh, expressible in first order logic. So we can actually use some uh, constraint calculus like uh, defined by Abel and Penman to try and preserve the this constraint at the level of the GPO rule. But the, our issue with doing that is that there is, uh, at least not to our knowledge, there is no constriction of a shift of conditions of uh, functors. So we don't really know how conditions should be transformed for, for scheme rules. And we have this issue that comes from geometric modeling that is because the rule is actually compiled into code, 
we cannot delay the verification to runtime in the sense that uh, whenever we have a, an operation, we, it results in some code that we can no longer modify uh, whenever it's applied on the object. So we, we have to consider a rule to be valid only if all its possible instantiation so you take any possible graph on which the graph the, the rule is applicable, then this would uh, this scheme rule is valid if on all these graphs uh, you obtain a rule that is consistent that is that preserves the consistency. So we only provided some set theory conditions on the rule scheme. I will not present all three of them, but I just want to talk about the gluing condition. Uh, in the case of standard GPO uh, applications, so if you take an adhesive category, uh, the gluing condition that may, mainly states that the graph transformation is applicable, uh, states that there should be a push-out complement over the match morphism and the left-hand morphism. And in the case of uh, monic matches uh, with graph, I mean, it's... A, you you can reduce the dangling condition the gluing condition to the dangling condition that means that you cannot have a node uh, that is deleted so it's in uh, the image of m uh, minus the image of k where k is the interface and it cannot be the source of target of an arc that is not uh, matched by um, in g from l and when you cons because we have some properties on the graph, so the incident arcs uh, constraint on the graph actually means that we can uh, reduce this condition again, uh, and we can only check it at the level of um, the scheme the scheme rule, regardless of the possible match, and it, it is uh, reduced to the fact that we cannot delete a node without deleting. Uh, an incident arc for each possible dimension. And so in this case, um, so here we have an example. Uh, and after we have somewhat uh, preserved the topology, we can also deal with the geometry. So in case of the geometry, the constraint is that all nodes that belong to an orbit that is supporting an embedding should have the same value. So in the case of, for instance, you can defi define face to be bared by, uh, sorry, colors to be bared by faces. So this means that all nodes that belong to a zero one orbit, in the case of a GMAP, should have the same color value. So as you can see on the left graph, uh, we have four faces, the pink face, the yellow face, the blue face, and the other pink face. And if we were to apply this modification at, at the middle of the, on the middle of the object, we will obtain an object where the face has three colors, which is not correct. So we have to somewhat restore the consistency. And the idea is that because uh, we do not know when we are considering the rule, what the size of the orbit will be, we have to consider, we, we extend the DPO rule by first grabbing the whole complete orbit for each uh, embedding that is concerned by the rewriting. And then once we've gotten the nodes, we add back their values. And we have a two-step way of extending the DPO rule in order to preserve uh, the consistency. And in this case, the constraint is only expressible using monadic so second order logic. So I believe that the constraint calculus that I know of at least uh, does not allow for such constraint. So here again, we define some set theory, um, set theory constraint on the, on the graph and on the transformation. And the last thing I wanna talk about briefly is the fact that uh, this transformation that I talked about uh, they encompass the previous definition uh, that used variables in order to uh, generalize the operations to a given cell. 
And uh, if you take the rule that is on the right, that is a rule with variable, you can translate it on a rule scheme uh, for the, this is only working for the case of GMAP since variables only works for GMAP. And what you do is that you relabel each dimension using its position. So zero becomes zero, zero, one that is in the second position, but you start counting at zero is turned into one, one. And then you do the same for all possible relations and you and all the arcs that are linking two nodes are labeled by epsilon and then as the word and then they keep the dimension. And if we consider this operation in the case of oriented map, uh, as we can see, we have some arcs that are not labeled with epsilon as uh, the word part of the label. So this operation, that is the triangulation, would not have been expressible using variables. And because we haven't yet done um, the geometry preservation in the case of rule schemes expressed using product, uh, what Akim will present is the current version of Jabua, which uses this formalism uh, to represent rules. And I just want to give a few examples. So here is a, the do sabin subdivision that recursively subdivides a surface. And the second one is the, some kind of manger sponge in, in, in which you perform, uh, you add two holes uh, along each dimension. And the, the rule that is at the bottom uh, contains something like uh, 80 nodes and each node actually represents an isomorphic copy of the left node. So whenever you're applying this rule on a somewhat already subdivided object, so like this one, this one would have around a thousand nodes if I were to represent the uh, as a graph, it as a graph, and each uh, node in the scheme rule actually, sorry, actually represents around a thousand node and we can write the, the transformation from this already subdivided square into this more subdivided square with this single rule. And now I believe it's time for Akim to give you a presentation of the tool that is called Jabra. You know, thank you. I think you should, okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, just time to share. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, present you the demonstration part of the previous uh, presentation done by uh, Romain. Uh, the first one, I come from uh, computer graphic and I will uh, present you some element uh, directly on the Jabra part. You must know uh, we have two tools in the Jabra platform. The first one, the, the editor will help you to design your operation and the runtime library that will help you to apply this operation. Okay. First, I will present you uh, some element, concrete element uh, on, on the editor. You can see here the real editor used currently with the old syntax as uh, said um, uh, Romain. You can see here one operation that take um, two faces and we simplify the uh, common age uh, inside. We use the modeler to present um, uh, a mesh simplifier, a mesh simplifier or a mesh decimeter. Uh, in other words, we would like to simplify uh, geometrically uh, some meshes and we have some for example, some other rule. And in this case, we can have a, a, a fictional age in geometry. I will show you uh, an explanation just after. And in this case, it's very useful to present you the di dynamic verification that helps you to detect error directly on the design uh, time. Okay. Uh, and in this one, when you are finished to modelize your, uh, your rule, you can generate uh, the code for that, I will now swap, oh, I, I forget to present you. Yeah, okay, 
my uh, the folder is completely empty except the, the, the modeler. And I will now generate. And in this path, I can see the all the files generated. And if I edit, for example, one rule, you can see in this uh, generator, we generate a Java language. But if you want, we can generate a C++ language. Uh, yeah, just here. For example, you have the C++ header and the C++ source file. You have the same thing for other element and so on. And everything is uh, on bed. And uh, from this uh, uh, source file, we can compile it to execute the uh, like the mesh simplifier. So the, the modeler that represents so all these elements to apply this application. You can find on the, on the viewer all rules designed previously in the editor. I will load you a small example. And in this case, we can see we have some uh, lattice of faces, we can control the the, the, the exploded view of faces because in the real geometric object is uh, a just a, a simple surface, a square subdivided a few times. But with the Jabra, we can display explicitly the geometry, the topology uh, of the GMAP with that. And if I try to select and apply a no specific operation, we can see that Jabra detects immediately uh, uh, an error and give you some explanation in accordance to the previous presentation of, uh, of Romain, where there is no matching uh, on the left hand side of an operation. Of course, if I try to, to play, in this case, we would like to simplify some geometric Phase, adjacent faces. You can see these both faces are uh, have the, the same normal or flat. And if in this case we can apply it very quickly, I can continue a few times. Okay, but in this case, if I try to apply the same operation, there is some error because we come in a specific case where the one arc and the two arc are exactly the same. This case is very dangerous in computer graphics because we call it a fictional edges, a fictional edge. And we must make a specific treatment for that in order to avoid to fail the topology, for example, to obtain a new volume uh, reduced to one vertex, for example, or to have some tricky uh, or, or other tricky um, uh, geometry. And in this case, we can see with Jabra, we it detects this configuration. We made a second rule, the simple first side dangling, and we can use this one to apply and to delete correctly this operation. The matching platform is very useful for that. Now we have some uh, export format. Uh, as, uh, as you can see, we have, uh, I, sorry, I will just put it in Greta demo. Greta demo is empty, uh, Greta demo, okay. And if I try to uh, mesh simpler, You can have here a demonstration with uh, the well-known uh, GFI tools that display a graph. And uh, with that, we can export from the topology some element. And we, dis we export the graph from the Jaboa into a common uh, format for a graph uh, community. It's very useful to make uh, a classical operation. And you can uh, refine the formalism presented uh, by Romain, where the two arc on blue, zero arc on da, on, or black, and one arc on, on red. And we may have some more uh, geometrical example. Uh, I forget to, to kit this one. Java, char. 
Uh, I will show you now a more complex modeler. That is a modeler uh, used for the demonstration. When we have a uh, li little more uh, rules operation, and if I create uh, a cube, I have always some specific visualization of my graph. Uh, in, we've mixed the geometry to display the faces. And uh, I, I will try to present you the manager sponge. Uh, sorry, I forget to select one element. Jabra was white. And you can see here, we have the manager with one hole. Roman, we present you with two holes. It is a, a very similar operation. And we can apply this one many times. You can see the, the size of the GMAP. Currently, we are around uh, 20,000 of, uh, of darts, of uh, nodes inside my, my graph, and become very, very uh, EV in memory. I think I will stop here, but we can go very further, uh, you can see in the, in the previous element. And of course, we can export this object uh, directly for the graph community. I will export here in a specific format. Not the MTL, it would be more quickly. And in this case, if I double click on this element, this time we have a common tool called MeshLab, a very famous um, uh, tool in computer graphics to display geometric without topology. In this case, we are uh, remove all topology part to, re uh, to conserve only the geometry part. And you can see the object here. And this object can be added in any other 3D application like games or anyone. This object is uh, correct. OK. Uh, I think. Uh, it will be OK here. Then we have just see a more general, a more general operation with many uh, classical operation. But we have more dedicated application. The first one is all the procedural generation. Um, the procedural generation relies on a mechanism very close of the, um, of the uh, of, uh, application of uh, um, grammar language. Uh, in computer graphics, we use uh, the L system, for example. But uh, in, uh, in uh, graph rewriting, is very similar. I will present you here the different element. You can see we start from the, um, the middle right uh, cube. And all other are uh, uh, sued or added or append to this one in accordance of many inside operation. For that, I will just launch this operation. And here, we will see the application for that and the importance of this. Oh, sorry. Uh, of this application, we can see. And you can see this operation. And this application comes directly for, from the own, own interface. And you can change directly the element. For example, we remove the, uh, sorry, it is the French, um, it is a French name of the different part of a cathedral uh, because we work with that uh, with French archaeologists that would like to uh, labelize, labelize the call correctly each volume inside. If, for example, I take one volume, we can see this one is corresponding to an empty wall. Sorry, it's French. And for this one, it is the same thing, and so on. You, you may have many other. For example, here we have selected a pillar, and so on. We can uh, change uh, the element as you wish. Uh, for example, we can increase the size of the nef, of the, the, the entrance of the cathedral. We can uh, see that the computation take, is very fast, but it may take many times to go 
deeper to add some uh, architectural element. That, that's all. We can, of course, uh, generate as the whole an object uh, and uh, add it into uh, a game and so on. And from example, we have more um, practical example. We have uh, we have we had a partnership with Total and GeoSiris uh, around the oil reservoir detection. Um, the the case is to represent the subsoil uh, precisely and to make some uh, computation inside to find the original um, original de deposit time of the origin. And uh, I can I cannot show you some uh, demo from this part because it's too heavy to make uh, and take too many times to to present you this part. But uh, we you have a, a beautiful animation of that. And we have a last uh, but not least example that is the physical simulation. And I will present you this part now in more details. Always, there is, uh, we have developed all rules inside uh, Jaboa. And in this example, we can see, uh, we can see here, uh, here we can see some element. I need, I need to initialize all physical element because this um, demonstration, this tools Jaffe uh, use uh, many physics systems because you it help uh, physical um, uh, scientist to make some to test her his sorry his computational physics models. Okay. Okay. And now, uh, sorry, I forget to check one. Yes, it's better. And now I can launch the simulation. And it takes many times, but we can see if I try to select one, select a node, and to pin this one, to pin, I mean, the node is blocked, is fixed. And you can see the physical react directly inside. We man didn't manage the collision. In this, in this uh, demo, but you can see uh, everything is adapted. You have here an example in 2D. I must wait the end of the simulation and I may present you the, uh, the, the 3D example. I will unpin everything. In this case, I say everything can move, every vertex can move, and I can fix another one if I want. And you can see I fix this one and everything will react directly in real, real time. Uh, can you stop the simulation? Okay, we must end. I... Yeah, okay. Uh, to prove the multi computational physics, I present you a 3D object to a tetrahedron. And in this case, I will present you uh, the FEM application. The previous application was a math spring computation. And in this case, we have another. We can see the element. And I will try to make as previously, I will fix another, uh, another vertex. And you can see the reaction is directly. Uh, you can see that the, with the Jarboa, to conclude, we can see that with Jarboa, we have uh, many concrete applications over the, uh, the, the, the grammar defined by Romain. We are very happy of this part because we have a well-formalized structure that enforces the quality of operation. We, we propose uh, ease development of new operation by detecting missed configuration, for example, with the simplification of the mesh, where I detect um, the fictional edge, for example, in computer graphic. And we, the, this, uh, this aspect, this, uh, this grammar, this language, help you to make uh, a more uh, trends in computer graphic to parallelize uh, any operation 
without uh, deep knowledge in, uh, paralyz in parallelization. You can see here few uh, stats of that. The blue, the blue line corresponding to the classical, the standard, the sequential Jarboa application, and the red one represents the, para the, the, parallelized, the parallel version of uh, Jarboa, and you can see the, the parallel uh, gain uh, a couple of times um, uh, during the application of different elements. Finally, uh, the, the little inconvenience or the EV memory representation uh, that is common with topology-based uh, representation in computer graphic. And you can see on the very EV application, we have, um, uh, we take many times to apply uh, all the elements because of uh, some verification uh, that are made dynamically. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. It was really interesting to see. Um, I enjoyed those, those, those simulations. So um, maybe I can kick off with a, with a few questions. Um, one or two, maybe at the beginning. Um, so um, I think I'm pretty clear in, in the first half about the formalization of the basic rewriting steps and the consistency questions and, and, and so on. Um, what I find interesting now, and which I only just picked up uh, in your in your in your in your demo at the end, is that you must have a, a number of different ways in which you apply rules. So apart from the fact that obviously you have a mechanism for applying one for applying a rule at a match. So so we've seen generation processes, you know, like like your your cathedral that you built there. Uh, we've certainly seen simulations as in the last part, um, and you've, we've seen sort of transformations. And, and my, so certainly for, for, for simulations, um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I will let you answer, but, but, but my instinct is that in some of these cases, you apply rules individually, and in other cases, you apply rules, basically all the possible, you apply one rule at all the possible matches. Um, or you apply rules for as long as possible, or sort of the different modes uh, uh, by which you match and apply the rules. So could you uh, sort of relate that and say, so which of these which of these applications require which kind of policy of application? Yeah, I, I can answer, Romain. Yes, of course. Uh, it seems uh, a more technical question. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, in reality, we are understanding and we make a specific um, engine that we call it the, the Jabra engine that take any rule written in the syntax of uh, Romain and uh, apply it. And this, uh, this engine can apply exactly one rule but as you say uh, as you say but sorry 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 can i can I come come in here so so applying one rule at a random at an arbitrary match or at a specific match or at all possible matches so what yeah yeah the the match is done uh, dynamically if I, if for example i will take i will retake an example Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, if I have, uh, no, no, not this one, it would be uh, too, too uh, time consuming. If I retake my example of the flight so fast, and uh, for example, we just wait a second, take, I have this one. And in this case, for example, if I, if the matching of this rule is done when you select explicitly the the initial the the hook we call it the hook the initial part. For example, here we can see we force the two arc must be connected at the same alpha one, mm -hmm. and in this configuration, it, there is no, no no node that follow that satisfies its condition. In this case, if I select. Um, maybe you didn't see it very clearly. Hmm. I will try to. Uh, do you see the the pink, the pink dot? Okay. And from this one, Jabra will try to match to apply this operation 
where there is the double line and a, mm -hmm. a match in um, associate this one, this node to this uh, dart, this uh, node inside the object. And we try to um, apply to match the other, the, the, the neighbor with the, the room. And if we try to apply, Jabwa will say, ah, ah. Oui, I have. Oh. Yeah, okay. Uh, Jabra, we apply, we try to apply it and detect some error in this case. And you can have some exactly the, the message. It say you, uh, the node N3 is, uh, is connected to alpha 2 to the node N2, whereas we would like to, to connect this situation N3 to N2, N3 to N2, and it didn't find this arc. That means this error and this, verifi this uh, verification is done uh, initially when, we want, when you want to apply uh, an operation. Yeah, so, so okay, but, so that I understand. So you give it an anchor, as I would call it, or maybe a starting point for the matching. Yeah. And yes. then you say, can you please find me a match and then apply the rule. And then it says, no, I can't find you a match because there is an edge missing mm -hmm. here. So that is, that is, that is clear. So that's one, one of the ways yeah. in which you use this. So I'm, I'm, but I think there are other, so I'm, I'm thinking about the other examples. So if you have a transformation that, that for example, generates, um, uh, I mean, if you take the cube with a hole in each face and, and you apply this manager rule or however you call that, yeah. um, which basically take, subdivides each, each line and puts another hole in there. So that is a rule that at least as far as I understand needs to be applied in parallel, essentially, uh, at all possible matches rather than at one specific match. Ah, you're talking so, about the engine. Uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying there are, there are, there must be different. I don't know whether to call them policies or, or, or um, different, different modes of applying rules. For example, either by specifying one particular match or starting point for a match, and then try to apply one single rule at one single match or one where you apply a rule at all the batches that you can find, or one where you apply uh, 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 maybe one rule or several rules over and over again, for example, in order to run a simulation. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand yeah. that kind of dimension beyond application of individual rules. Can I give partial solution, Akim? Yeah. Okay, so as far, for instance, if you consider the manager sponge, so when you're making a hole into the volume, uh, the rule actually takes a, a whole volume. So, and, and, and then you can take several volume that are um, attached to one another. So the rule actually modify the whole uh, cube at once. And even when there is already holes in it, it the, there is like the product construction that I explained, uh, like somewhat multiplies the rule. Okay. And then there is, at the end, there is still one match. So that it's still oh, a single application of the rule. Um, but what I believe you were talking about uh, when uh, regarding, for instance, uh, the generation of the Castile rule, uh, you had, there is the idea that you may want to select the rule and you may want to detect where the rule is actually applicable. So in the tool, uh, the rules, like the formal rules, the scheme rules, that are compiled, so you obtain a code, and then, and then this code, you can just uh, reuse it inside a, a more complex software. So yeah. then you can just define whatever policy you want to apply the rules, and you will obtain a specific uh, modeler, so a specific software for units. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the gen, uh, the, uh, what is it called again? For, for in the case of the Castle rule, basically you have some kind of grammars that say you should apply this kind of rules uh, several times, and then you apply this mm -hmm. kind of rules. And so you have a global grammar that will then call the specific rule uh, as, it's, as, it, as, as they are needed to be applied. And in the case of the simulation, I believe that uh, it's heavily uh, geometric because as, as you can see, the, the object was not, 
like split into two parts of stuff like that. So it's only modifying the embedding values. Mm -hmm. So you, there is, so you, you, it's just like every X uh, step of time, you, you compute the new values of the geometry and then you redisplay the object. So it's just like a single rule that is updated every like a few milliseconds or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Right, so, so that, okay, so that means you don't have a, um, so, so, okay, so you have basically, because of the rule schemas and because of the sort of the, the pullback thing you do, um, if I understand correctly, you don't need something saying apply this rule on all possible matches because you can, that's already built in into the notion yeah. of, of rule that's, application. Yeah, so that's, 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 that's clear. Um, and anything that goes beyond that, um, you handle via basically programming the kind of control yeah. that yeah. you need into the into yeah, the code yeah. which 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 you generate or basically on top of the code that you generate. Yeah, uh, yeah. maybe Akim, you can show an example of script rule, which yeah, is a rule I, I would that... like. Yeah, I would like to present it just after. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay. And just here, but uh, in this case, you can see uh, you have there is a uh, two kind of element, and in the case of the script you can uh, call directly the, the rule application. Mm -hmm. And we rely in the, to, to simulate your, um, the application on the wall object by calling uh, ons by ons uh, a rule. Uh, for example, I just, uh, I will retake another example. For example, I apply the, the mesh simplification by, uh, by hand one by one, but I would like, if I want to apply uh, all rule over all the surfaces. I just align this application and simplify all element at once. Mm -hmm. And then you have a script basically controlling yeah. that. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, there has been some work in in I mean, not not some a lot of work on 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 exactly that question. Um, basically assuming that you have a basic mechanism for applying rules, how do you then uh, uh, design a control flow language on top of that, that allows you to, to do this kind of scripting? Yeah, so that may be interesting just to, 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 to understand. I mean, Hans Jörg has been working on this for uh, uh, some time, for example, I think he's here, uh, I saw him earlier. Um, but also uh, there are also other sort of uh, a graph rewriting language just like GP2, for example, is, is a language which is heavily based on yeah, GP2 is, is GP2. By, by Detlef Plum mostly. So um, it's a language that is heavily based on basically programming on top of graph rewriting rules. Yeah. 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 Okay. So maybe worth just, just checking out as, 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 as related work. I mean, it probably doesn't do much beyond what you're doing anyway, because you can, if you, if you have that in a programming language, you're very flexible, you can do whatever you want, but it's, a, it's, it's a sort of higher level scripting yeah. language. Yeah. For, not, for procedural, yeah, maybe for procedural, uh, generation, for example, where you have some rule and you would like to apply this one, uh, for all elements. Yeah. We will look, look, uh, look, the, on this element. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I, I like it. It's very interesting. And so this 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 oil reservoir detection is also a simulation, or what is? So I didn't quite. Or is that a kind of generation process? Uh, no, in this uh, project is with um, uh, we would like to focus on the modeling uh, the, the modeling of the subsoil, but the um, uh, simulation is not our part. We would like to present a mesh with uh, some properties with a specific uh, uh, element, for example, the layering. The layering uh, must be very specific. And after that, when the mesh is completely uh, correct, we give them to the physic physician uh, to, uh, to make some uh, deep simulation. We've, um, I don't remember the, the exactly the, the physics model, but it, I think it was um, FEM, finite element methods. Mm -hmm. Would be a typical thing to do there, yes. OK, OK. Cool. Yeah, thank you. That's, I think, answers sort of most of my questions for now. So anyone else any has a question? Sorry, I don't see all yeah. the... 
the way it stands now because I'm in the wrong view. Is there any? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick? Yeah, so, uh, sorry, uh, maybe Hans Jörg should go first. Hans Jörg, yeah. You unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, I was not sure that I would like to say something at all, but uh, <laughs> if you ask me now, uh, my question would be, so uh, we did some work in Bremen on collage grammars uh, quite 15, 20 years ago, uh, and this, uh, this very well, nicely documented in the handbook, uh, volume three and in, in a book by Frank Dreves uh, and uh, we used a kind of uh, context-free grammar style uh, where we applied rules in parallel often. Uh, for example, the Menga sponge, sponge uh, could be modeled in this way in a context-free way. So this would be my question. How much context-freeness is in your uh, models where you apply the rules in parallel, or at least where it looks like parallel mode of rewriting? Um, um, I, I believe one, uh, for instance, if you take uh, the example of the cathedral again, so the procedural um, generation. In in this case, uh, all rules are somewhat context-free, in the sense that there is nothing uh, around the left the node. I mean, on the left hand side, there is a single node, so it's always applicable because you can always find a match. Um, but uh, our idea was. Uh, more or less to be able to define any kind of modeling operations. So there are some objects that are only modeled by context-free grammars, but if you want a tool to be able to perform uh, some specific operation, you may need to add context. For instance, you may want to subdivide an edge only if it is on the outer face, so you need to somewhat add information uh, saying, okay, this edge is actually on the outer face and you can subdivide it. So in this case, you obtain a grammar that is not context-free. I don't know if that's okay. the whole okay. answer to your question. But it's nevertheless uh, it's still a kind of context-free rewriting with extra conditions. So yes. it uh, okay. Not completely. Uh, we are working on this part to uh, to manage the overlap of uh, matching of two rules inside the same geometry. It is the figure on the bottom right where we compute uh, an islet. We try to determine a right order, but it is not uh, completely finished. Okay. Yes. Okay. I I uh, can see very well that you try to. Uh, overcome, uh, get more general operations than just yeah. context-free replacements. Okay. Yeah. This all looked very, quite nice, I must say. Okay, thank, thank, you thank you. Thank you very much. Nick, you had a question as well? Yes, um, I, I just want to uh, thanks thanks to you both for a very very nice presentation. Um, also interesting topic I think uh, to consider for transformation. Very <laughs> very interesting the engineering. So um, I just wanted to uh, comment again because I mean I should say Roma and uh, I we had already a discussion some time ago. Um, I find quite interesting that you identified a use case for monadic second order logic. Um, for formulating conditions, because I suppose the difficulty here is in the beginning, it looks like, for example, you have a grid of squares, and then you want to subdivide it in such a fashion as there is a planar configuration of faces. Yes. So, I mean, yes. uh, so it's not just the graph, uh, because the graph itself doesn't have information on, on whether there are two squares touching or 10 or, or yes. whatnot, as long as you look at just one edge and two neighboring pairs. So I suppose it's interesting to know 
presumably there will be other applications whenever you have a configuration where it's not just a graph, but some topological information. And um, I think for our community, maybe for the theorists, it could be quite interesting to look at, first of all, does there exist something like a shift construction for monadic second order logic, at least under maybe some mild constraints. And then I also found interesting, even for first order logic, even for the one we usually do for a nested application condition, it could be interesting to look at whether there exists a constraint calculus for these pullback constructions. So it's, uh, I suppose it's going back to Raikou's question, you have a very special type of, say, global application where you control it by a type of pullback construction, yes? Yeah. But uh, this seems to be factorial and we are working a adhesive category. So I mm -hmm. suppose one should definitely have a look at whether one can lift the hubble penemann calculus to the setting. And I do remember from Penemann's thesis that there was some, some experiments with this. I, th I think this cast was with Bruno Corsell at some point. Okay. So, but it's, it's uh, 10 years ago, so maybe worth looking again. So, so do you have any, because then, then again, you say you, since you didn't have the calculus, then you went to the set based. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, uh, I actually took a pe pen and paper and when we're doing only, um, so only DPO on GMAP or OMAP, uh, you can define all the constraints uh, using Abel and Penman's work. So then you can define conditions on the rule. Uh, it works kind of, I mean, it's just application of the work. But then we, uh, there is the issue uh, about geometry already. Uh, even if you only consider DPO, I mean, somewhat standard DPO rewriting, uh, maybe I can show my slides again, if you don't mind, Akim. Yeah, Maybe why you change slides, because um, I'm mentioning this also because there is applications biology, for example, for tissue modeling, where, again, it's dif difficult mm -hmm. to implement exactly planarity of configurations or in combinatorics, you know, tessellation yeah. and stuff like that. So this might be really worthwhile having a look what one can yeah. say from categorical calculus, yes. Yeah. But like, yeah, in this case, it's only at the level of DPO. We have mm -hmm. not made the step yet to uh, our scheme rules but but you know at this at this step you're somewhat modifying two distinct faces but there is the issue that you don't know what is actually the size of the face once you're going to apply the rule yeah but, uh, but so this is sorry and this so, is exactly what, what i mean because here yeah. here this is a point because you mentioned monadic second order logic so here's a question is can you express the closure of this as a monadic second order formula, yes? So is it enough yeah. to formulate that when there is a closed loop, this will lead to a conflict? Yeah. So, I mean, of course, as I see, you can instantiate it. Yeah, yeah, we, we somewhat, uh, like, we use the topology in order to guide us to, to get back what we're missing, and such that uh, in the end, we'll, we, you obtain a transformation that is bigger than, than the sim uh, simple DPO that is at the beginning, uh, like on the top, so you somewhat modify this rule to obtain the rule at the bottom. And uh, I'm pretty sure that using a second order logic, you can somewhat specify the conditions. Uh, so yeah, that uh, you, you would add a condition on the rule and then you, you would know that this rule is correct and this single rule is not correct. But uh, I don't know how to do it using uh, like the constraint calculus. I mean, you, at least you, the known that I've yeah. read. You're almost hinting at it because essentially the solution mm -hmm. here is that um, you provide one possible witness of closing the sort yeah. of the open path. And so essentially, presumably, the solution would look something like for all situations where the path is closed. I mean, this is something as long as you expect finiteness of the configuration. Um, but, but, yeah, but the, the path... Uh, because the path will, in the end, represent the orbits, you're sure that the orbit will somewhat close properly. Yeah, but you, you, you do have an invariant on your structure. You are, you're telling yeah. us in the very beginning, hey, this yeah. is a GMAP, so I know more about these loops than in, if it was just any arbitrary graph. Yes. So the, in the hubble penemann calculus, the real gem of the calculus is this constraint-preserving calculus. So whenever you have constraints on your structure, which you know to be globally true, and you just want to ask not any graph as input, but a constraint one. 
then you can sometimes yeah. simplify considerably these checks. Yeah. I, I suspect this would be very worthwhile here for your calculus if one can do it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I haven't, I haven't really dwell into the, into it yet, at least. Yeah, but one should, one should, one should check this. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, okay. it's interesting. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, any more questions from the audience? Okay, if that's not the case, let me just check if I can see anything. Uh, Where's my chat? Um, um, yeah, so, 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 um, so we seem to be okay now in terms of the general discussion. So I would like to close the official part of the seminar here, um, and we can remain in this in this in this meeting, of course, for sort of for further informal chats. Uh, but thanks okay. very much to um, the speakers and for the nice presentation and to the audience for the. Um, attendance and, and interesting questions and i see you all in a couple of weeks so you want to give a brief advertisement um nick on what is happening in two weeks um i, I should check more cl carefully but i think we will have something on model transformation in two weeks but uh, okay. yeah okay. so I, i'm just closing the the stream now if anybody on youtube would want to interact with the speakers directly here we stay for a moment on the zoom so just join us the link is in the youtube chat and thanks again to you both for the nice time